Today is, is one of those uh, amazing days of the year. Uh, these are the great days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah's uh, out of His mercy, He gave us this day, these days. He doesn't have to. But He is just so generous, He gave us these days. And one of those days of the year is the day of Arafah. And the day of Arafah, it's the day that we are supposed to come to know our Lord through His mercy. To have a ma'rifah of Allah through the mercy of Allah. This is a day where Adam alayhi salam finds his wife after losing her when they came to this world, searching for each other and making dua to find uh, his other half and finds her on the, on, on the Jabal al-Rahma, mountain of mercy. Um, this is a day that where all of the pilgrim, they stand on this mountain of mercy and you can see and everybody's making dua. There's a, there's a time that every pilgrim, inshallah, those who have gone to Hajj, alhamdulillah, they've, they've been blessed and may Allah take us back again. Those who haven't been to Hajj, may Allah fulfill that and make it easy for them to go and make the pilgrimage. But when you go and you see on this day that uh, you can't even see rocks or mountains or desert. It's just human being all dressed in white, uh, pure uh, clothing, and just making dua. It's just everybody's making dua. And everybody's asking for forgiveness on that day. One of the things that our Shaykh told us is nobody on the day of Arafah is asking for justice. Nobody's asking for just justice. Why? This is the day of dua. Why aren't they just asking for justice? Because you don't want justice. We don't want justice with Allah either. We don't want Allah to have justice with us. Because if He does, nobody will enter paradise. No one can enter paradise. And that when the, the mother of the believers, the wife of the Prophet asks, even you, even you will enter paradise with His mercy? He said, even I will enter paradise with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not with justice of God that we will enter paradise. Rather, with His mercy. So everybody's making dua on this day, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Now, why is dua important in our tradition? And why is it foundational? The, and the biggest tragedy of our time, and this is those who are my age and older, they can testify to this. That our children do not have the same connection with Allah than our fathers and mothers and than us. And the reason for that is because we didn't teach them from a young age to make dua. How we were taught. From a young age. You want to oh, make dua, inshallah it will happen. Oh, you want, you want this bicycle? Make dua, inshallah it will happen. Oh, you want your homework to become easier? Make dua. Dua is a connection between the believer and his creator. The more dua you make, the more you're connected with your creator. It is not the last resort. Rather, it's the first option. Whatever calamity happens to you, if you get sick, the first thing you do, you don't call the doctor or go on Google, hey, I have this headache. What's, you know, how do I fix this? What medicine? No, the first thing you do is say, Ya Allah, you're the healer. You're the healer. You know, Maulana Rumi said, As Haman Jaw Kerasa Dard, Haman Jaw's Dawa. He said, The one that gives you the pain, he's also the doctor. The healer has given you the pain so you can ask him to heal you. So it will strengthen this relationship that you have with your Lord. So the first option, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, difficulties, financial difficulties, children difficulty. Parents' difficulties, societal difficulties. What do you do? The first thing, you go to Allah and you make dua. And this is the foundation of our religion. A dua, silahul mu'min. The Prophet is a beautiful metaphor. And a lot of people don't understand this hadith. That the dua is the weapon of believers. What happens if you have a weapon with you all the time? First of all, you feel protected. Because nobody's going to attack you if you're walking with weapons. Everybody's like, okay, make way for this person. It's your weapon. It's your spiritual weapon that you have. 
And that weapon goes straight. Straight, as one of our, our shiuch said, their weapons goes curved. They throw a rocket, it goes from here, and it drops here. Our weapon goes straight to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dua goes straight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why it's the weapon of the believers. You don't leave your home without your weapon. You don't go sleep without your weapon by your bed. You don't go anywhere without your weapon. You need the spiritual weapon with you all the time. And this is why the one of the best dua books that's been translated into English is called The Mindful Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but translated by uh, Sheikh Hamza and Dr. Asad Tarsin. Beautiful translate. It's about, it shows you about our Prophet Sallallahu how mindful he was in every step of the day. If he went to the bathroom, there was a dua. Exited the bathroom, there was a dua. And also there was a mindfulness that when you enter, you enter with the left foot into the bathroom. So that consciousness has come to you that I'm going in a place, I need to make this dua. When you come out, you come out with the right foot. You enter your house, you enter with the right foot. You say salam. Why do we say salam if there's nobody in the house? Why do you say salam alaikum when there's nobody in the house? Because there are angels in the house. You're greeting the spiritual being of the house. So you become mindful and you realize that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he was just strengthening his relationship with his Lord so much that he became Habibullah. Every moment, every action, every day, at night, first thing that he gets up, a dua. When he goes to sleep, a dua. Goes to the bathroom, a dua. Wudu, a dua. Every limb of the body, a body, a dua. Why is he doing? strengthening this relationship? What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah Allah is the wali of the believer. If you have Allah on your side, you don't need anyone else. He suffices. If Allah is with you, you don't need anything else. But if you don't have Allah, and you have the entire armies of the world behind you, you're still vulnerable. You're still vulnerable. You're like a glass case that could be broken with a pebble. But if you are with Allah, and Rumi said something very interesting. He said, the difference between the one, the difference between the one who has Allah in his heart, who has Allah on his, on his tongue, who has this relationship with Allah, and the one who has abandoned Allah, he said, what's the difference between that? He said, here's the difference. He said, he said, if Allah leaves you and you are a ruby, Allah will turn you into a worthless rock. But if Allah is with you and you are a worthless rock, he will turn you into a priceless ruby. That's, that's the difference. You're still a rock. Both ruby and a rock, they're the same. The genus is the same. It's the same. They're stone. One is worthless, one is priceless. If you have Allah, you become priceless. But if you don't, you become worthless. These are, this is why we are making dua. This is why these days come, the days of Arafah, the, these days of Ramadan, these days that remind ourselves that we need to reconnect with Allah. Now dua, here's the thing, there's three aspects to dua. One, you make dua, Allah answers it. You make dua, Allah answers it. Right? وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمَ دُعُونِي Allah says, you call upon me, I answer it. I'll answer your dua. And that's our lives. We call upon him, he answers. We ask, he gives. Right? If you look at your children, those people who have young kids and they grew up, they should have died a thousand times before they hit the age of seven. They should have died a thousand times. Why are they alive? Oh, man. Oh, just grab. You're going to fall from the chair. That fall would have been deadly. Why did they put the, like my sheikh said, why did they put the fork into the electric thing? 
they get electrocuted. And as a father, you see this. Oh my God, if you would have fallen, if you would have fallen, if this would have happened, if this would have happened. These are all because of your du'as. It's the du'as that's doing that. It's protection for your kids, for yourself, for your health, for your well-being. All of these things that we don't see. We don't see uh, somebody, you know, somebody's uh, house caught on fire. But what about every other house that never caught on fire? Why? Shouldn't it caught fire? Don't we make the same mistake? We don't leave the iron on. We don't leave the stove on. Everybody does that. But it's your du'as. Allah is protecting you. You have that protection. So Allah answers that. And we don't see it. But on the day of judgment, Allah removes the veil. And he will tell you, look at what I did. With all you do, look. That time, this time, your son, your daughter, your children, your wealth, your health, all of that. You ask, I did it. And I didn't even show you that I did it. This is the generosity of your Lord. If you do some good to somebody, you want to show them. Oh, well, I, I ordered this book for you. Here you go. We don't send it anonymous to their house. Oh, somebody sent me a book. Who? I don't know. We tell them, hey, I send you a book. Oh, I send you this gift. We tell them. It's the nature of a human being. But Allah is not doing that. He's so generous. On the day of judgment, he's going to show us. For us to know that I answered your du'as. Second, Allah doesn't hear your du'as. He refuses to hear your du'as. I said, so why would he refuse to hear our du'as? Mawlana in the Muslim, he has a beautiful story about a snake charmer. He's in Baghdad and he makes money from, uh, from his snake show. People from subcontinent, they know, they traditionally they had these people with snakes and they would come at the corner of the street and they would do all these dazzling things and people would throw money on them. That's how they make their money. So this guy has a giant snake and that's how he makes his living. That's his job. Every morning he comes. Yeah, so he takes a lunch break, comes back, snake is gone. Somebody stole a snake. He gets really upset. And he starts going after this man. And he says, I got to find him because this is bread and butter. This is what puts food on my table. This is what feeds my, my and you say, Ya Allah, this is the sabab. You gave me this. Let me find this guy. And he starts making dua. A street to street in Baghdad. Ya Allah, please, if you find me, I'll give this, I'll show this guy, and I'll take my snake back, and I'll go do my show. Please, Ya Allah, please, why aren't you listening to my dua? Why can I find my snake? As he's having this conversation with his Lord, he passed by, and he sees a man on the street, dead, and turned completely blue. And he said, oh my God, my snake did that. My snake did this. And he realizes that it was a poisonous snake. It wasn't a poisonless. He didn't know. He thought it was a poisonless snake like the other snake he had. So now he tells Allah, Ya Allah, I want to thank you for not listening to my dog. I want to thank you for not listening to my dog. Because I thought it was for my benefit to get the, the snake. I didn't know it was for my heart. I didn't know I would be this dead man now. So Rumi said, Pas do'aho kon ziyon as to halak, as karam mi nashnavad yaz dona pak. He said, your Lord, out of his generosity, he refuses to hear your du'as when you ask for poisonous snake. And how many people, they ask for poisonous snake and yet they don't know. Right? They don't say, Ya Allah, give me this job. Ya Allah, give me this job. Maybe that job is a poisonous snake for you. And you don't know. Ya Allah, let me marry this person. Maybe this person is a poisonous snake with you. And you've been tortured for the rest of your life. We ask for things, but we don't ask. When you make dua, it was one of the, my teachers, he learned it from his sheikh 
in, in Yemen, and he told me, he said, uh, he told a story about a man who went to Hajj. He went to Hajj and he said, Ya Allah, you know, when you see the Kaaba, they say the first dua is accepted. First time you see the Kaaba. And that's why people who go to Umrah, it's good not to look at the Kaaba until you get close. So you put your head down. Right? When we take the group, it's like everybody looks at me like, why do you do this city? I said, listen, this is it. This, you only get one chance in life. So I put everybody's head down. I said, walk down, look at your feet. I'll tell you. Just go straight. And everybody goes. And then once we get to the Sahan and the Kaaba is right, I said, now raise your head and make your dua. So then you can see the Kaaba. Because you can see through the cracks in the pillars. And then th that's it. You just lost that dua because you just saw a, a bits of it, right? So, so he made a dua. He said, Ya Allah, I want to die as a shaheed, as a martyr. So high maqam. Everybody should have that. If you have that dua that you want to die as a shaheed, even if you die in your bed, Allah will give you the rank of a martyr. This is generosity of Allah according to our Prophet So he says that he fix, uh, finishes his hajj and he goes back home. As soon as he arrives to his town, before he gets home, a lion attacks him, rips him apart, and he kills him. And he becomes a shaheed because if uh, you're attacked by an animal after a pure hajj, and he dies. So the ulama, they say, he got the martyrdom, but in a horrible way. So you would say, Ya Allah, give me whatever you want with khair, lutf, and afia. Everything that you want with khair, lutf, and afia. Khair, this is which is good for me. Lutf, give me with gentleness. Allah can give you something in any which way he wants, but the best way is to come through lutf through gentleness, and afia through well-being. That is, we don't, we, a lot of us, we limit Allah. We think that he can only do things in one way. One thing that Mawlana Rumi said, he said, sometimes you get stuck in a room with no doors in life. You feel like, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to get out of this, 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 this situation? There's no way out of this because up block down block in front block behind block right block left block he said Rumi said you look at all direction and it's all block right so Rumi said Allah says in the Munajat don't ask me how am I going to make a way for you? Because all directions are blocked. I'm the creator of direction. And I'll make another direction that you don't see. I'll make another direction. You, don't, you only see six directions. I'll make another one. Because I'm the creator of direction. I'm the creator of walls. And I'm the creator of doors. Right? Allah is the creator. So... Dua. Yeah. It doesn't get accepted because you're asking for poisonous snake. Right? And there's one, one of probably my favorite hadith, Qudsi. On the day of judgment, Allah reminds His servant. And this is very important for us to know because we are people who forget. Human being, the nature of human being, we forget. What did Allah do? He made forgetfulness impossible for him. Right? He doesn't forget. He doesn't doze off. He doesn't sleep. This Ayatul Kursi, when we read it, right? Doesn't doze off. Doesn't sleep. No forgetfulness with Allah. We forget. Right? So Allah says to his servant, says, each and every one of you, all of you, he will say to each one of us, do you remember that time? Your financial difficulty? Oh, oh yeah, that time I remember. Specific time Allah will remind you. Remember you made dua sincere from the heart? Yes. Remember I alleviated that? I removed that difficulty from you? Oh yes, I remember. Ya Allah, thank you, thank you. And then people remember those moments. Do you remember that time you were sick and you asked for healing? And I give you healing? Oh yeah, I remember it was really painful. Thank you, Ya Allah, thank you. Do you remember that time you had difficulty with your family? 
Do you remember this time that he had this? Do you remember this? Allah keeps reminding his servant. Do you remember all this time he made dua and I answered him? He said, yes, and the servant is joyful and happy because he remembers all these time of happiness that he, time that he came out. From Qabd, he went to Bast. From this constriction, he went to opening. And then Allah says, do you remember that time? You had really difficult time. A lot of problems. You ask sincerely. You ask me. Ya Allah, alleviate me from this. Please. And I didn't. And the servant breaks down. Because even the pain of the dunya in that moment, this is a day of judgment, not paradise yet. You know, pain is, is very interesting. He says, I remember, I remember that time. And you didn't. You didn't remove that pain. You didn't alleviate me from that situation. I remember. He said, do you know why? He said, I don't know. You, you're wisdom. Why? He said, because I want to answer that dua now. Enter my paradise. What a Lord. What a generous God we have. I'm going to answer it now. Enter my paradise. So sometimes we feel like Allah is not answering. He's delaying the answer. Because he's going to give you an amazing answer. He's going to give you an amazing answer. That's our Lord. That's Allah. Dua, make dua for yourself. Make dua for your children. Make dua for your offspring. Most of you are here in the masjid in America. Because maybe your great-grandfather made dua for his duriyat. And you're here from their dua. It just got delayed and Allah answered it four generations later or five generations later. or two. Just keep making dua. You say, oh, my son, oh, my daughter. Okay. The mother of Mary, Ali salam, you know what was her dua? Mother of Maryam, Ali salam. Ya Allah, give me a, give me a, a son to become a prophet. That was her dua. She wanted the prophet. A son to be a... When she had a baby, they said it's a girl. But she didn't know that her dua was already answered. And Isa alayhi salam comes from her daughter without a father. Isa a.s. from her daughter, from Maryam a.s. without a father. We don't know the wisdom of Allah. Just keep making, don't stop making dua. In one of uh, Hafiz, the great Hafiz Shirazi, he said, he gave advice to himself. And one of the things about when you read poetry, when the poets give advice to themselves or to their beloved, when they say to my John, you know, John, in my life, my soul, or, or to their children, or when they mention their own name, those are the best advice. Because you can't give better advice, like, whatever you want for yourself is like the best thing. You, nobody wants to harm themselves. He said, Hafiz, Wazifei tu do all goftanas to bas, darban da on mabosh, ki He said, Oh, Hafiz, your job is to keep making dua. That's your job. It's not your job to say, oh, did he hear it? Didn't he hear it? Is he going to answer? Isn't he going to answer? That's not your job. That's not your job. Your job is to continue making dua. But make dua. Make dua for grant, for things that are, that, that's not, that doesn't expire. Not ephemeral things. Don't make dua for expired stuff. People make dua, okay, I wish, I, you know, my first major dua, I wasn't going to share this, but I'll share it. Uh, my first major dua was for a bicycle. I was like probably like six or seven, and I saw this catalog from Iran. And this is during the war in Afghanistan. So this magazine, and then in the magazine there was an ad for this bicycle. It looked like a bicycle from heaven, amazing bicycle. Uh, you know, when you're that age, that's it. And I was like, oh, my God, I want that. So I, there's no way I could ask anybody for this. Because war, borders are closed. There's no shopping. There's no this. 
I just used to go in the corner of my room and say, oh, I want this bicycle. You know I want this bicycle. Yeah, Allah, I want this. And I had the thing cut out, and I put it under my pillow every night, and I sleep on it. So, anyways, months pass by. I keep making these laws. And me and my brother used to share a room. Uh, after a couple of months, my mom called me and goes, come downstairs. Your brother sent you something. A huge box. Open the box. It's the bicycle. It's the one from the picture. And I'm like, yes, yes, you heard it. Yes. And I was so happy. It was such an amazing connection in that moment. I didn't know that my brother was very annoyed with me making these du'as all the time. You know, like, he couldn't understand. So he saw the picture. And when I was, he took it from under my pillow and he showed me, I go, oh, this poor kid has been crying for months. My mom gave it to my brother. And then this basically uh, circulated, and then they went and they sent somebody, and because I was the youngest in the family, so they, 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 you know, spoiled. And they got it. But I didn't know about the result of it like till like 10 years later. I always thought that, no, Allah just worked. And that's how Allah works. Allah did that. Allah made my brother hear it. Allah inspired him to give it to my mom. Allah inspired my mom to give it to my brother. Allah inspired my brother during war to send somebody to another nation to bring. It's all Allah. He did all of that. It's not like you say, oh, yeah, well, Allah didn't just drop it from the heaven for you. That's how Allah works. That's how he does things. Through us, Bob. He could have just not inspired my brother who did that. He was just throwing it in the trash. But he did it. He did it. There's a uh, famous story of a, of a, of a Pahlawan. Um, he is mentioned in the uh, in the Tazkiratul um, Awliya of Fariduddin Attar. This Pahlawan of, is the Iranian Persian Pahlawan. And he's undefeated, completely undefeated. He's the king's pahlawan. So whenever the wrestlers, they come in, traditionally they would bring the kings and they would have a, a wrestling match in front of the kings of other nations. So the king, uh, the, the prince, one of the prince from India is, comes to visit Persia and uh, uh, the Khalifa says that, okay, we'll have a wrestling match. Everybody knows about this. Pahlawan Mahmoud Puriya. That's his name. Pahlawan Mahmoud Puriya. Everybody knows Mahmoud Puriya is like Khabib. Like there's no way you can beat this guy. Like this guy is, is deadly. And they come. And this Indian wrestler is good. But he knows he's, he's not that good. Like he knows there's no. So anyways, Pahlawan Mahmoud is very smart. He always wants to know the, 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 the moves of his opponent. Because if you know their moves, you can, you know, how they play, you can actually uh, defeat them easily. The mother of the Indian wrestler is shivering at night. Because he knows, oh, Pahlawan Mahmoud, he, he, he can break the bones of people. So he, she is in a courtyard, and she's just saying, Ya Allah, please don't humiliate my son. Ya Allah, please don't humiliate my son. Ya Allah, I, I don't hurt my son. I don't want him to get hurt. My son is going against this beast, Pahlawan Mahmoud Puriya. What is he going to do? Ya Allah. So she's making it. So Mahmoud, Mahmoud Puriya wants to see how this guy trains. And at this time that the mother is making dua, he's on the roof trying to find out if he's practicing in a courtyard. So he hears the dua of the mother. He hears this dua, Ya Allah, protect my son from this guy. I hope he doesn't hurt my son. I hope I, if, he, if my son is defeated, the prince is going to, what is he going to do with him when we get back? How humiliating that would be. So she's making this dua to Allah and he hears it. So the next day they go, the battle, everybody's there. Mahmoud, Mahmoud, everybody's shouting. And they go into battle and he starts fighting and fighting and fighting. And they're all shocked. Like, oh, this Indian prince is really good. Beats him up, knocks him out. Mahmoud falls down. Then lose, first loss, king throws the towel at him, get him out of my, my castle. He's done. His whole thing is done. That night he falls asleep 
and he sees in his dream and he hears the voice of God and says, we know why you did that. We know why you did that. You wanted her dua to become true. And you were the one that could do that. Nobody else could do this. Only you could do this. And you did it. And you did it for me. Even though nobody will ever remember you as a wrestler, I'm going to make you be remembered as my awliya. And he is one of the top saints. Two saints that we have in the history of Islam that were wrestlers. He's one of them. Why? Dua. All asbab. And if you can make somebody's dua become a reality, go ahead. And you would see the result of how Allah will deal with you and what He's going to turn you into. And what He's going to turn you into. So, to conclude, du'as have adab. Have to have. But Mawlana Rumi says something very interesting. He said, when you're making du'a, Allah is not interested in your grammar. He's interested in the grammar of the heart. Right? You need grammar of the heart. You don't need morphology. You don't need sarf al nahu You need grammar of the heart. Speak from the heart. Speak in any language. The best dua, the best dua is when you're tongue-tied and you can't say anything. And Allah hears everything. You don't have to. Allah doesn't need you to come and say, and it's like when people go to Hajj, with a, I, they go to Hajj and they're making it off of the house with a paper in their hand. How do you make dua like that? You have paper in your hand? Imagine somebody comes to you and they want to tell you something. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum, welcome. Like, that's so stupid. It's so disrespectful. To the one who understands your thoughts, who created your tongue, who inspires you to say it, and you're still going to try to be uh, politically correct and with a paper, just speak from your heart. People say, oh, I don't have a lot of surahs memorized. They have all of Allah had memorized. Yeah, just keep repeating it. Do you have la ilaha illallah? It just keeps repeating it. You know, alhamdulillah, just say alhamdulillah. Converts go there, they don't know much. That's just say alhamdulillah. Say Allahu Akbar, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. Whatever you, just say, say it in English. You, Allah, you are great. Praise be to you. I love you. Just talk to Allah from your heart. Don't talk from a paper. Don't talk from a paper. You know, uh, Maulana has a story about a, a king who, a uh, good king, a lot of people love him. But it's specifically one man. One man is in love with the king. Everybody knows the lover of the king. Oh, the lover of the king. He walks out, everybody knows him. He he's, he's loves the king. The king of all of the people in the nation knows him. Knows him by name. My lover. This man, oh man, he gave my life. He would give his life for the king. Anything. You can't say anything bad about the king. As just every prayer, he does two units of nafal, sends it to the protection of the king. He's an amazing man. Loves the king. Everybody knows. So he goes to see the king once a year in the castle. When he goes, everybody wants to say, hey, can you tell the king to do this? Because if you tell him, he would never say no to you. He would never say no to you. So he goes every year. So he goes to the king, and he, his pocket is full with paper, all proposals for people. Hey, king, if you can help me buy a house, if you can give me donation, if you can get my brother out of prison. If you, everybody has issues to the king. So his pocket is full of just proposal to the king. And he goes to the king, he's, he said, when I get there, I will tell him, I'll read one by one, and I'll tell him all your stuff, and he will do it. I, I'm, trust me, this is the least I can do for you guys. <laughs> he goes, and he says, and they said, listen, we know the king. This is hundreds of things. If you can get us like 
10 approval, we are more than happy. If you get 10 approval, if you get five, we are happy. We know that he's not gonna answer all of this. You have like hundreds of, of proposals here. So he goes to the king and he sees the king comes into the room. He says, oh my, false. He was unconscious from the love of the king, smiling. And the king says, oh, you can't even look at me. Look how much he loves me. Look at you guys. Look how much he loves me. As he falls, the papers come out from his pocket. And the king says, take all of those proposals, answer all of them. Take all the proposal, answer all of them. Had he proposed it, he would have got 5% or 10% done. But because of the love, because he couldn't say it, Allah answered all of it. So whatever is in your heart when you make dua, Allah knows your heart. You don't have to say sing. Sometimes you get overwhelmed. Allah knows your heart. That's just at the moment that you just overwhelmed. You have so many things you want to ask. And don't think, you know, that you can, you're asking too much from Allah. You know, you can't ask too much from Allah. Right? But the greatest thing you can ask from Allah is my favorite scholar of all time, Khaja Abdullah Ansari. He said, everyone who comes to your door, everyone who comes to your door, Ya Allah, they want something from you. Man Omadam as tu I came to your door, I want you from you. Everyone wants something from you? I want you from you. I want you to give me you. Put you in my heart. Put your light in my heart. Because if I have you, I have everything. I'm that priceless ruby. And if I don't have you, I'm a worthless rock. I have nothing. And that's the way of our ulama. That's the way of our teachers. That's the way of our religion. It's the religion of dua. We have abandoned the du'as. One of my sheikh's son uh, told me, he said that his father said to him that if you want to teach your children anything, teach them these two things. One, to make du'a, this connection from a young age. Oh, you want this? Make du'a, inshallah, Allah will facilitate. And they make du'a and then make it happen. Oh, you want ice cream? Keep making du'a. Maybe Allah will make it happen. And then they make dua. You say, well, do you make enough dua? Did you just, how many times you say? Five? Oh, say more. Come on, ask more. And they go, hey, it's, I think it's ice cream time. Wow, do you dua was answered, right? So you would do that from a young age, you three, four, so they can get this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing to teach them is tawbah. Whatever you do, you make a mistake. Make sure you ask Allah for forgiveness. Make sure. So that tawbah in dua are the two jewels you can give your children. Everything else is extra and additional. The two things you can give that is essential, that will connect them with Allah, is teach them to make dua for whatever they want, and to make tawbah, inshallah. And may Allah make us amongst the people of dua, and the people of tawbah, inshallah, in these blessed days, and blessed nights of, uh, last, of the first 10 days of Dhil Hajjah, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, if there's any Correction, comment, or question, and then that will do a dua, inshallah. Dave Arafa dua. Do you have any question for Siti Faridun? Yeah, we heard a lot about dua. It's time for dua, especially after Asr. Go to Maghrib, comes close. We can do individual dua, face the qibla, ask Allah for anything. It's the best time to make dua. Same thing like the hujjaj doing Arafah. Sidi uh, Faridun, he mentioned a very important point. If you don't know how to make dua, what the, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ, told him, teach me some dua, I don't know how to make dua. And the Prophet told him, what do you say? He said, I just say, Allahumma dkhil lil jannah wa najjini min al nar. He said, I just ask Allah to put me in jannah and to keep me away from the hellfire. The Prophet ﷺ has said this very important statement after that. He said, nudandin. All what we do, all what we say, all what we ask Allah is about this. So if you're saying this, this is enough. 
So if you don't know the Quran, you know Qul Allah Ahad, recite Qul Allah Ahad many times. We're all, it's the whole Quran. Uh, Fatiha, same thing, same dua, inshallah. Any dua that you can make, inshallah, good dua, it's uh, beneficial, inshallah. Let's, so let's make dua together, then we'll give you a few minutes to make dua individual, inshallah, Amen. before Maghrib, inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا وحبيبنا المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ورضي الله عن ساداتنا أصحاب رسول الله أجمعين وخصوصا أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وعن سائر الصحابة أجمعين وعن التابعين وتابع التابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعن معهم بفضلك وجودك وكرمك يا أكرم الأكرمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا رب العالمين اللهم بارك لنا في هذا اليوم يا رب العالمين اللهم تقبل فيه أعمالنا وتقبل فيه صيامنا وتقبل فيه صلاتنا واغفر فيه ذنبنا يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا جميعا يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم تب علينا وهدنا يا رب العالمين اللهم اشف مرضانا اللهم اشف مرضانا اللهم اشف مرضانا وعاف مبتلانا اللهم عاف مبتلانا يا رب العالمين اللهم اصلح أولادنا اللهم اصلح بناتنا اللهم اصلح نساءنا اللهم اصلح رجالنا اللهم اصلح مجتمعنا يا رب العالمين اللهم زدنا ولا تنقصنا واثرنا ولا تأثر علينا يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر لجميع المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك يا مولانا سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات اللهم عافنا من بلاء الدنيا وعذاب الآخرة واعف عنا يا رب العالمين واعف عنا يا أكرم الأكرمين اللهم اجعلنا لك ذاكرين اللهم اجعلنا لك شاكرين اللهم اجعلنا لك أوابين اللهم اجعلنا إليك منيبين اللهم اجعلنا عليك متوكلين يا رب العالمين اللهم عافنا من بلاء الدنيا وعذاب الآخرة واعف عنا يا رب العالمين اللهم مغفرتك أوسع من ذنوبنا ورحمتك أرجى عندنا من أعمالنا فارحمنا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين يا رب العالمين يا أكرم الأكرمين يا أول الأولين يا آخر الآخرين يا ذا القوة المتين يا راحم الفقراء والضعفاء والمساكين ارحم اللهم ضعفنا اللهم ارحم ضعفنا يا رب العالمين اللهم ارحم ضعفنا يا رب العالمين اللهم اكرمنا بكرمك يا رب العالمين وزدنا من فضلك يا أكرم الأكرمين اللهم ثبتنا بالقول الثابت في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة واجمع شمل المسلمين اللهم اجمع شمل المسلمين على الحق والدين اللهم انصرهم في كل مكان وفي كل زمان يا رب العالمين وخصوصا في فلسطين والشام والعراق واليمن وفي السودان وفي أفغانستان وباكستان والهند وروما وبرما يا رب العالمين اللهم انصر إخواننا في كل زمان ومكان يا أكرم الأكرمين يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم يقول لإخواننا وإخواننا في الصين وليا وناصرا يا رب العالمين اللهم اجمع شمل المسلمين ووحد كلمتهم يا أرحم الراحمين وردهم إلى دينهم ردا جميلا يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل جمعنا هذا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا سالما موفقا من الشر معصوما اللهم لا تجعل فينا ولا منا ولا معنا شقيا ولا محروما ولا معذبا بنار اللهم يا أرحم الراحمين يا رب العالمين ارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين أجمعين رب اغفر لنا ولوالدينا وارحمهما كما ربونا صغارا يا رب العالمين من كان منهم ميتا فاللهم ارحمه في هذا اليوم اللهم وسع قبره اللهم نور قبره واجعل قبرهم ضياء ونورا عليهم يا رب العالمين وإن كان حيا فاللهم متعه, متعه بالصحة والعافية من كان من والدين حيا فاللهم متعه بالصحة والعافية يا 
رب العالمين اللهم اهدنا جميعا لما تحبه وترضاه يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك ومحبتك ومحبة نبينا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ومحبة الفقراء والمساكين وإذا أردت بعبادك فتنة فاقبضنا إليك غير مفتونين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين يا رب العالمين Please make special dua for brother he is in the hospital almost like more than two months his name is Sabir so he asks today to make dua for him inshallah Allahumma shfihi ya rabbil alameen Allahumma aafihi ya rabbil alameen Allahumma shfihi wa aafihi ya rabbil alameen اللهم رب الناس اذهب الباس اشفي انت الشافي لا شفاء الا شفاءك شفاء لا يغادر سقما ولا يترك الما صلى الله العظيم رب العرش العظيم ان يعافي اخينا صابر مما هو فيه اللهم عافه مما هو فيه اللهم عافه مما هو فيه امين امين وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحه